Wahiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahiguru Ji Ki Fateh. Um, thank you to everyone that's tuning in today uh, for this uh, discussion um, on the Bantha Punjab uh, webinar. Um, today's uh, discussion is, um, as always with Bantha Punjab, um, super timely and relevant, especially that's uh, with everything that's been going on and um, the increasing pitch of resistance and the increasing pitch of violence from the state towards um, the peacefully protesting farmers. Um, as you will know, the Panth Punjab project, it serves to facilitate critical discussions that analyze our current socio-political conditions and help us reflect on the future of our Sangash. Following the violent repression of the Sikh Jijaru Lair in the early 1900s, uh, sorry, in the early 1990s, we have seen our local, regional and geopolitical realities rapidly transform. Accurately pinpointing these changes is pivotal to us identifying the current problems that we need to address and the challenges on our path forward. The nation building and state building projects of the Indian state have entered a new phase, featuring a steady um, consolidation of fascism and Hindu nationalism um, with unbridled crony capitalism. Increasing centralization and the ongoing state repression of dissent um, within communities. And not only um, has an ascendant Indian elite begun to flex its muscles on the global stage, but the political, social and economic domination of Delhi has been further solidified within the subcontinent with the support of new foreign allies. This project will function as a collective platform for a new generation to analyze the context we exist in and map out the networks of power that have been mobilized against us. And so we can together mark the signposts on our path towards collective liberation. And as we've seen on the 26th of January, um, the, the, the anger at the maintaining the state of status quo and the, the unwillingness of the Indian state to take the negotiations and the demands of the protesters seriously. We've seen that anger, um, an effort to contain that anger from both um, the organizing structures um, within the, the farmers' protest itself and obviously with, with the state and uh, in the Indian media. And that anger spilled out with the, uh, what we saw on the 26th of January uh, with the action um, at the Lal Kila. Um, and that's had uh, repercussions and reverberations all over um, the world, especially in Delhi, we've seen a mounting crackdown on peaceful protesters. Um, and in addition to that, we've seen um, the continuation of the Indian state's tactics of silencing, silencing and violently repressing dissent. We've seen the, uh, the abduction and the arrest of protesters, of journalists, of even medical personnel that have been treating protesters and the police um, indiscriminately. And beyond the, the borders of the Indian state, we've seen suspension of online services and news channels, particularly from the Sikh community, that have been sharing um, credible news footage with uh, a clear centering on the Bant and its uh, political realities. And in that, we've seen the removal of uh, the Twitter pages of Sikh Siyasat, and as well as Bant Punjab, which um, as a project is still in its infancy. So the, the repression and the crack down of the Indian state should be something that is um, a sign for all of us that these conversations have always been important but in this particular moment for us building collectively together for us to look at the context and for us to um, challenge the, 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 the structure of power that's mobilizing against us is, is all the more relevant today. Um, and since the beginning of the Delhi Mocha, we've seen renewed waves of protests around the world, as well as numerous debates about the goals and the tactics of resistance. Um, today, we will speak with Harsha Walia about the lessons the diaspora should learn from those on the ground in Punjab and Delhi, and we'll discuss strategies uh, for us to effectively confront the, imperial, the imperialism around the world, including the importance of grassroots organizing, direct action, and solidarity. And I'll hand it over to Gurnishan Virji to introduce um, our Benji. Um, so, like uh, Shamshir Paji said, our um, our bulara for today is Benji Harsha Walia, and I mean, uh, she's done tremendous, tremendous, tremendous work in the community. Um, she's uh, she's the author of um, uh, the rise of racist nationalism. Sorry, she's author of um, undoing border imperialism, and she's a co-author for Never Home: Legislating Decriminal. Uh, De 
criminalization and Canadian immigration, as well as Red Women Rising, Indigenous Women Survivors in the Vancouver's downtown east side. She also has a book coming up called Border and Rural Global Migration and Capitalism and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. And that topic ties in with our conversation um, very, very, very well today. Um, the discussion, everything that we're seeing unfolding. So I, we feel like she's the perfect individual to talk to about the things that are uh, going on that the world is witnessing taking place in Delhi right now. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Harsha Walia so she can um, get the conversation going for today. And if she can just give us her views on how she views the Morcha, how the resistance that we've been taking, uh, seeing unfold to the Delhi Takht in, um, in Delhi from Punjab, Haryana, UP, and all those from all around the subcontinent, how she sees those events, how she understands those events, and what her take on that whole situation is. Vaheguruji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguruji Ki Fateh, thank you so much for having me, Bajis. Um, and before I start, I just want to express my solidarity to Pant Punjab. Um, I know you all are, are facing attacks and suspension and silencing of your Twitter and your social media accounts and in general. Um, and I just want to express my solidarity for your steadfast for your steadfastness. Um, and you know, and fate, fate to you, fate to all of us. Um, I know that that we will we will get through this and we will win this um Chardikala, right? So I just want to start off in that way. Um, thank you all of us who are tuning in. I know we're tuning in from so many places. Good morning. Good evening to everyone. Um, so I understand our format is that we're going to mainly do a, a Q&A because we're also thinking about uh, questions and things on our mind. This is a really um, hard time for a lot of us in the Sangat, right? Our families are there in Delhi. Our loved ones are in Delhi. We're worried about what's happening in Punjab and Delhi and elsewhere. So we're going to keep it um, as a kind of Q&A and also to think about the questions um, that Bajis posed in the beginning, which is how do we make sense of this moment? And also, what does this mean for strategies and tactics for all of us here in the diaspora about how we support and understand this moment? Um, so I'll, I'll start uh, with just, I think about 10 minutes is my initial time, and then we're gonna open it up. Um, so first, uh, you know, just to, so this conversation today is about imperialism. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a big word. <laughs> and, and even knew when Baji was introducing my book, I know that's a lot of big words, um, but I know that we understand these words, right? Um, but I just, I wanna um, share what, what I think of when I um, hear and use the frame of imperialism. And here I think of Edward Said, who is a Palestinian writer and a Palestinian scholar and when Edward Said wrote about imperialism, he had a very easy to understand definition. And he talks about imperialism as quote, thinking about settling on controlling land that you do not possess, that is distant, that is lived on and owned by others, right? So it's really about understanding uh, economic and political control over a people and a territory and a land uh, where you yourself do not live, where you yourself do not build community, where you do not have relations, where you are not accountable um, to anybody, right? So that's um, that's what he's talking about when he's talking about imperialism. And of course, that ties in very neatly um, and clearly when we think about the Indian state. I uh, have no problem talking about the Indian state as not only a colonial state that is occupying you know, many peoples, of course, especially and in including Kashmir, um, but that India is an imperialist state that is increasingly extending its reach um, to people within the so-called, within the borders of so-called India and also beyond, right? India is a, is a, is a geopolitical imperial power. Um, so it's not just the United States, it's not just the UK, India is squarely an imperialist state when we think about those definitions of, of control and power. Um, and of course, you know, one of the things, the ways in which we respond to imperialism, um, and you know, here for me, I invoke Shahid Bhagat Singh, who says freedom is an imperishable birthright of all, right? So anti-imperialist movements uh, invoke the spirit of freedom. Um, freedom as the counter to imperialism. And so what does this mean in, you know, in the marches that are happening right now? This is, of course, not a, like a theoretical conversation. Um, but I think what's uh, really clear in the marches right now, and especially after January 26th, 
is the ways in which imperialism is part of the resistance, right? So the resistance to the farm bills uh, and the resistance to the three farm bills is of course about um, corporate control. It's about the ways in which this farm bill increasingly privatizes and takes lands and resources and leaves farm owners and farm workers um, in debt uh, and impoverished. And this is also about imperialism, which is the control of the center over the Punjab. I'm not limited to, but especially Punjab, which is at the epicenter. And it is, you know, of course, undeniable that while the farmers protest um, involves farmers and in involves the solidarity of farmers from many, many, many states, um, and that is important to uplift, it is also important to recognize that this is also very much in the legacy of Punjabi and Sikh resistance to the center and the politics of the center. Um, and that dates back to the British Raj, right? Um, and again, this is, we're not gonna go into history right now, but I just wanna contextualize that what's happening in 2020 goes back decades, if not centuries. Um, and the British Raj ever since, you know, ever since partition, um, and especially if we think about the Green Revolution, um, and you know, I must say about the Green Revolution, very few people, uh, we don't, we, we rarely talk about um, the international dimensions of the Green Revolution, but I think it's important to emphasize and for all of us to know that the Green Revolution in India and all of the, um, the harm and violence that it caused, right? So the Green Revolution was imposing industrial agricultural production in Punjab. This was actually a template for the world. This wasn't just an experiment in India. This was an imperialist, um, you know, deeply capitalist, you know, corporate capitalist agenda that internationally, um, international actors like the World Bank and the predecessors of the World Bank sunk their money into. So this was it. This was about the Indian state, and it was also a continuation of the kind of politics of the British Raj, right? Where everyone, where the imperial forces from abroad uh, were also involved in the decimation um, of land and livelihood in the Punjab, right? And it's as a result of the Green Revolution that we see this horrific legacy of farmer suicides. And the fact that in Punjab, you know, there's so many statistics, but one that really um, speaks to the ways in which imperialism works is the fact that most farmers in Punjab have debt that is two and a half times larger than the rest of India. Two and a half times larger. Um, and debt is, you know, I'll just focus here on a second about debt because we're talking about imperialism and capitalism. Debt is like a key feature of imperialism and capitalism, because the way that you keep people, there's two, you know, there's many methods, but two of the main pillars globally that you keep people oppressed and suppressed. One is, of course, military might, right? Brutal state force, um, brutal state violence, which of course we see in Punjab, um, especially in including from the 1980s and, you know, the use of anti terrorism, anti terrorism legislation, the genocide, the counterinsurgency. So all of that is the overt state force and military might. Um, and then the other is the kind of economic pillar of imperialism and capitalism. And debt is a central one there, right? Which is you keep people deliberately impoverished and you keep them beholden to you through debt. Um, debt, of course, predates capitalism, but it has really increased capital accumulation um, increases through the use of debt as a mechanism of discipline. And so um, it is you know, really important when we're thinking about this current moment that we see the ways in which debt is operating alongside this more overt act of state violence. Um, and you know, just coming now, moving to the, the current moment and you know, what, how do we understand the marchas? I think those are some of the ways in which we understand the marchas, right? Is that it's, it's, it's this long legacy of repression um, that the Punjab and also farmers across India, but again, in this heightened way in Punjab have, have faced. It is, as Baji was talking about, also the consolidation of Hindu fascism um, and the rise of Hindutva, uh, which is, you know, it's important to, of course, name it's about Modi, but it's not just about Modi, right? Hindu fascism is baked into the Indian state since its very founding. Um, it's also very much about, you know, corporate control, of course, Adani, Ambani, and all of the, all of the corporations that are being boycotted. And here, I think it's really important to understand how Hindutva 
is not contradictory to global capitalism, right? The Hindutva tries to present itself as a very kind of localized project, like, you know, here for the, like, you know, the small farmers, we're here for the, um, you know, the, the very kind of parochial sense of Hindutva that it invokes. But Hindutva as a kind of populist ideology is not contradictory to global capitalism, right? Like Modi is one of the world's business, most business friendly leaders. Um, so he's a Hindutva fascist and he's a capitalist and those are not contradictory. Those work perfectly together because both of those ideologies are about oppression at its core. Um, and in the Morcha now, I think the, the two things that I would highlight that we really have to keep in mind, and I think that the diaspora is really well positioned to push back against, which of course is why uh, so many, uh, you know, so many, for example, social media accounts are being silenced, um, is one is like just rejecting the ways in which the backlash to January 26th has been to, you know, um, for example, when the Nishan Sab was raised at the Lal Kila, right? Right away, a lot of ways in which people responded that to that was to say, oh, but don't worry, we didn't, you know, the Tranga is still on the Red Fort, right? Um, and, you know, my position on that personally is like, you know, so what if the Nishan Sab had replaced the Tranga? <laughs> what is this, in, in my view, there's nothing to be proud of with the Tranga. The Tranga represents bloody wars, it represents occupation, it represents state violence. Um, so it is important not to respond uh, with the kind of like, oh, but you know, we're good six, you know, we are patriots, we are, you know, we are Indians too, because that kind of nationalist narrative is just it's jingoism, and it bolsters the Indian state. And we know, uh, and all of us know that it is, you know, those who have always been cast outside the state, well, <laughs> our politics can't rest in this in the Indian state, right? That will never bring freedom. And so in these moments, while it can be a knee jerk and understandable reaction, because there's so much backlash, people feel the need to prove um, their loyalty. I think this is actually precisely the time to say, no, <laughs> we, are, we are loyal to, to freedom. We are loyal to the Sangat. We are loyal to the Panth. We are, you know, we are loyal uh, to, you know, Guru Nanak Dev Ji's teachings. We are caste abolitionists. We believe in freedom and equality for all. And the Thuranga just does not represent that. It is a flag that represents violence and war. Um, and so I think it's important to not uh, kind of play that narrative. And the other is uh, the idea of violence, right? Right now we know uh, that, you know, and we see this, right? A lot of liberals are coming out and saying, oh, I used to support the farmers protest, though they never did, <laughs> right? They just were riding the bandwagon, but who are now saying, oh, now I don't support the farmers protest because they were violent. And, you know, look what happened at the Lal Kila, look at what happened at the bus. And, you know, it is really important not to try to convince those folks, frankly, right? Like they're always going to be opportunistic. They're always going to be on and off the, the you know, the next cause. And it's really important to, you know, say, again, in my view, two things. One is that the core source of all violence is the Indian state. Uh, the core source of all violence is these systemic forces. It's not the people who are responding in self-defense. It is not people who are responding in anger. That violence is not comparable, right? Like a lifeless property, like an empty bus um, versus the lives of hundreds and hundreds of farmers who have just died. Not even, you know, let's not even talk about the past few decades. We're just talking about the past few months, right? Who have died of hypothermia? Who have you know? Who have died of various causes? That's actual harm. So it's important to not get into the violence, non-violence rhetoric, which never serves, um, never serves any struggle. Um, and also to to very much say, you know, some people people have a right to direct action. People can't just you know, peaceful protest is very important. And also people escalate for really re for good reasons, right? Which is that when you're fighting state power. Um, there are many reasons why you might decide to escalate a resistance. Um, and of course, we will face backlash for making those decisions. But the people who condemn us were never on board anyway. So it's important not to, um, to falter in, in those messages. And I think those two things about not trying, to, um, not trying to prove the kind of good sick narrative to kind of play the like, we are Indians too, we served in the army, right? Like the kind of good fudgy you know, kind of narrative, it's important to reject that. And it's also important to reject the, the kind of um, denouncing of so-called violence in, after the 26th, because the people who are being picked up need our solidarity, right? It's not about proving that they were innocent or not. 
they require our unconditional solidarity because the violence that they're gonna face from the Indian state um, has already and is going to be immense. And of course here, you know, I know so many people um, have been talking about how, how frankly triggering and traumatizing it is, right? In the Punjab and in Delhi that this is harkening back to the eighties. And so what we need is to come together. We need to not be um, disunified. We need to not be uh, divided in a politics that ultimately serves the Indian state and that will ultimately harm this, this moment and this movement. So um, those are some of my initial thoughts, um, but I, I look forward to, to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, really powerful introduction that kind of lays a lot of the groundwork where we want to begin this conversation from and, um, and set some of that direction. Um, and, and like you were saying, the Nishan Saib represents all of those challenges that you outlined to the Taranga and to the Indian nationalism and, and in the opinion of, of a lot of sects that I've spoken to, that's precisely why it was raised to show that there is a deeper clash underlying just um, you know, the, the um, agitation around the bills. So uh, just to kind of begin with, um, can you um, share your initial thoughts and reflections on, on the resistance that we've seen in Punjab and Delhi and what lessons um, we should learn uh, from that in terms of how we organize in the diaspora? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I have to say, you know, probably like all of us, I'm so inspired for many reasons. Um, but one is, you know, one of the ones coming as uh, someone who spent a lot of time organizing is the actual organization, right? Because we know that organization is the hardest thing, like just the very act of, of bringing people together is logistically difficult. Um, I think a few things stand out to me. And, you know, I don't want to suggest that they're contradictions, but I think whenever we have large mass scale, mass level movements with so many different people and ideas and ideologies and actors and, and things that undergird people's motivations, um, there are nuances that we have to tend to and build solidarity. Um, and you know, here I would very much echo and agree with Navyuk Baji, who I know has spoken uh, with Panth Project and others before, um, which is that it only really is through the process of struggle that we work that stuff out, right? These aren't like abstract theoretical divisions. It's like in the process of building Sangat, it's the process of learning and talking and debating um, that we work some of these out. But I think um, some of the things that have, have stood out uh, to me about the organization is of course, you know, the mass involvement first of, of unions. And I think there is no denying uh, that farm workers struggle have for a long time been supported by major unions um, at the same time, of course, we know that the unions have been, you know, have faced resistance from within, uh, within farmer organizations, for example, for, you know, just being too conciliatory with the state, right? So we know that even when the Morcha first began and was approaching the Lee, um, it was, uh, you know, many of the young Sikh youth organization, the Najavan organizations and others who said, no, we need to break through the barricades, right? We can't just, we can't stop here. Um, and so, you know, I think those are contradictions. I don't, um, I don't personally think that they're like major disagreements because in the, in the course of being on the street and in the course of being together, people worked that stuff out, right? So there's always that push and pull. Um, and so I think, you know, that is an important, an important place for us to continue to work together. And I think, especially after January 26th, it's really important um, that we continue to tend to those uh, tensions, I don't want to say divisions, though I know in the diaspora those have actually, and that's the thing that I think about, I'm like, well, it's too bad that in the diaspora, these divisions are much worse, right, which is if I were to simplify the kind of leftist comrade versus the Khalistani, right, we know that those divisions, I'm simplifying here, um, and I use that loosely because, you know, here in Vancouver, which is Coast Salish territories, we've had fights, um, and I think this is the place that we can talk about that, right, and rallies have been shouted down, um, but I think if we were to draw uh, inspiration from what's happening in Delhi and India, it's important to think about how can we come together? How can we mend you know, what happened in the 80s? Is there a possibility of mending? Is there a possibility of moving together in a better way? Um, and you know, the, the other thing um, that I think we uh, really have to take to heart uh, as well in the diaspora is the immense amount of work um, that has been done and that needs to be, that has been done and that continues to need to be done to truly be caste abolitionists, right? To truly um, annihilate caste 
uh, in the Sangat and in the Panth. And so, you know, the fact that many Dalit organizations um, ha are, have supported and are supporting um, the farmers' protest is really important. And I think, you know, again, uh, my hands are raised to Panth Punjab for, for talking about that openly, for having webinars about that, um, about the ways in which the abolition and annihilation of caste is part of Sikhi. And also we know that, you know, we don't always practice that, right? Um, and same with gender equity and more. So how can we actually be true to the ideals and, and teachings of Sikhi? Um, and so those are, you know, and in terms of organization, um, it is just, it is, uh, it is unthinkable that anyone would suggest that, um, you know, the principles of Seva, that the principles of Sikh social organization have not taken a lead role in the farmers protest, right? The fact that we can so quickly set up longer for all people, all people who are there for, you know, all the children on the street, um, that beautiful, beautiful act of service of, of Seva, of Namjapo, all of those um, principles of Sikhi uh, have really built the logistical infrastructure um, for these protests, right? And I think here, uh, all social movements have so much to learn. And, you know, in the diaspora, I'm always talking to people about like, can you imagine, can you imagine not just the numbers of people? Because a lot of people focus on the numbers, right? Like these protests are so large. But I'm like, have, have we ever stopped to think about how all those, you know, tons of thousands of people are organized, <laughs> that everyone has a place to sleep, that at night there's, you know, community safety patrols to make sure that, everything is safe, that there is food to make sure everyone is fed, that there's blankets to make sure everyone is warm. Like that is not just about numbers. That is about, you know, care and social organization. And of course, in the sick spirit about, about Seva. And so for me, when I think about organization um, and I have long, long talked about this, like to me, there is um, nothing, nothing more incredible um, than the Lungar Hall. Uh, in the entire world. <laughs> it represents the most, um, the most liberatory practice uh, in the entire world. Um, and so I, th I think about that a lot. And I think um, that is something that we should be talking about more. It's something that we should be talking about more because it teaches us how to live. Massively. I think uh, a lot of the times we have gone through history textbooks and we've read about different Morche and different Sangarsh and how they unfolded and the spirit that was within and how it unfolded. And I think now we're literally seeing the pages of history being written before us. Um, and I think this is something that's going to that's gonna sort of awake the spirit and so many Nojuans across the globe. Um, so it's a very, very, very powerful thing to see. But at the same time, I feel a lot of Nojuans uh, that are sitting in, in the diaspora that are not in Punjab or Delhi right now. They also have the sense of worry sometimes and they uh, also want to meaningfully sort of play their part in this morcha as well. So um, when we look at all the global, the global power structure, right? Because these uh, rules, they didn't come out of anything. Like there was, there was international pressure and there was international role that was at play as well, pushing these rules within India as well. So when we take that into consideration and looking at the nations that we're living in right now, um, how do you see that relationship between that and in terms of doing building uh, meaningful solidarity and having direct action work that we can do here? Like what are some of the things that the diaspora can do to be involved in this more in, uh, in a meaningful way while also understanding the nations that we're in, the relation they have to do these laws? Yeah, that's a great question, Baji. And, you know, I think about that a lot because I think in general, a lot of kind of global solidarity is this feeling of exactly as you said, right? Like um, powerlessness and being in the diaspora, like just so far away, wishing we were closer, feeling, you know, powerless, guilt, like all of those feelings at once. Um, and it can be very powerful and also very demobilizing. Um, and, you know, that feeling of like, what can we do? What can we do? Um, and of course, you know, donating money is often the first thing that comes to mind because it is, it, it's easy <laughs> it's in, and it's practical um, it's, and it's quick, it's individual, you know, we can just do it individually from our bank accounts. Um, but I think, you know, if a, a big part of what we can do, I think is actually things like this, right? How do we, because so much of the Morsha is, for example, educational work, right? We know that on the stages, there's movies, there's speeches, there are libraries, 
it's building our political consciousness, our social consciousness. Um, so I think part of being the Morcha is about, um, again, that act of coming together, right? The act of coming together, we can't underestimate because there is, there's no power in one person. And that's something the Morcha has taught us, right? There, each person has power, but the, the movement moves with everybody. Right. And so we can't do there are things we can do individually, but it, it won't have an impact because resistance is in struggle is collective. We have to build collectively. And so I think all of the ways in which we can come together to to talk, and especially in COVID when we can't meet, um, you know, rallies, uh, the kind of, you know, the rallies are so important. But I, 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 I feel you. I feel that there are a lot of um, there's a lot there's a lot more that we could be doing. Um, and here I think about, you know, it's occurred to me that a lot of rallies that have happened, at least where I'm located, um, you know, they tend to they tend to be outside the Indian embassy. Um, I've been part of actions where you occupy offices. So I think there's, you know, the possibility of bringing more heat uh, to Indian officials in the diaspora. I know that a lot of times um, our efforts are focused on um, lobbying our politicians to take a stand, to speak out, right? The power of having kind of Western politicians or politicians located in the West. And I think that's that's fine and important, but I think, you know, ultimately that doesn't really make a dent in international politics, right? Um, and so I think those are, you know, thinking about uh, escalating, thinking about escalating and forcing um, kind of foreign Western governments. And here, I think a big part is looking at things like trade agreements, right? What, it, what are the trade agreements that Canada or the UK or the US have with India? What are the Western state and corporate interests in this? Um, and so, you know, finding targets um, where we can apply directed pressure um, I think is another route to consider, right? Like how can we directly impact and force um, and put pressure on the Indian state, Indian forces of capital, as well as, you know, UK, US, Canadian, et cetera, state and their, their companies that are invested in, in um, you know, part of this, part of the farm bills or part of the lobbying, I should say, for the farm bills. Um, and so I think being a little bit more thoughtful and strategic about that global picture, that internationalist picture, and not only just, you know, let's just lobby our politicians to make a statement. I'm not saying that's a bad move, but I think that there's, made, there's more that we can do to directly impact um, the, the kind of capitalist and, and violent state forces. Um, and that, I think, is, is something that we can do here. So... Um... You know, we've all been following everything that's been happening in, in Delhi in the, the past few days in response to January 26th. Um, and two kind of major themes are coming out of the debates that we've seen, um, specifically around the protest tactics and, and nationalism. Um, on one hand, there's a debate about nonviolence versus so-called violent protests, you know, property damage, fighting the police um, and for other fascists. Um, and then on the other hand, there's this entire narrative of nationalism and, and demonization of Sikh activists for flying the Nishan side at the Lal Qila, um, because this is apparently what gave the government justification to crack down. Um, and both of these debates are essentially being used by the state and by union leaders to beat down and, and demonize more radical elements within the protest and simply consolidate power against any competing factions. So um, uh, I, I don't want to rehash uh, about the, all the social media debates and, and who said or did what, but I, I would like to ask you your thoughts and observations um, of the narrative and allegations themselves and how it's playing out right now. And, and why is this narrative so attractive to people? Um, and what problems do you see with these narratives, if, if any? Yeah, thank you for that, that question. And I, I think the, I'd say um, off the top of my head, I think the narrative is attractive to a lot of people um, for three main reasons. Uh, one is, is that, um, and I alluded to earlier, one is that liberal narratives that were very, you know, only opportunistically supporting the farmers protest now have a way to turn around and basically show their true colors, right? Which is that they never actually supported the protest. They now just have a reason <laughs> uh, because before they would have been condemned. Now they have a reason to condemn the protest by fixating on a tactic. Um, the second reason is I think, you know, those who are state lackeys, 
Um, and, you know, liberals can be state lackeys, but I, here I would make a slight distinction, which is, you know, really like agents of the state and lackeys of the state um, are very much embedded in a narrative of law and order, right? <laughs> like this, the Indian state is just so deeply, you know, India has one of the most powerful militaries in the world, like one of the largest paramilitary you know, the RSS is the world's largest volunteer paramilitary organization that is, of course, embedded in Hindutva fascism, but is also deeply disciplined um, into punishment, right, into keeping social control and, of course, keeping especially the caste order, maintaining the caste order. Um, and so it's, you know, state lackeys are very, are very um, embedded in that kind of preservation uh, of the social order, right? And so anyone who, you know, who approaches or who breaks through a police ranks just causes um, just so much cognitive dissonance for them, right? So for them, of course, it's about maintaining the social order of the state, reinforcing their power. So it's, it's not about only quashing this morsha, it's also about having quashed the anti-CAA protests. It's also about having quashed Muslim resistance. It's also about having quashed Dalit resistance, right? It's about quashing many forms of social resistance for them. Um, the third I'd say is that, of course, and I think I don't say them in any particular order, I think they all work together, is that, of course, it gives the state to continue, a reason to continue to specifically criminalize Sikh community and Sikh movements um, and a way to continue to stigmatize and cast out um, Sikh social resistance, right? And so that's, of course, you know, uh, as you said, we won't rehash it, but we know that the Indian state, its relationship to the Sikh community um, and the ways in which the kind of trope of uh, the Sikh terrorist, the Sikh Khalistani, the Sikh extremist, the Sikh violence, et cetera, that trope, um, the way that that's kept in check is by keeping Sikh, you know, the Sikh community and the Sangat and the Pant oppressed in other ways, right? So in this moment, it harkens back to the 1980s of the trope of Sikh extremism. Um, and so I think, you know, those are, those are some of the reasons um, that I think this moment is erupting in this in this way. Um, and I think, you know, as you've said, I, I, I strongly denounce and disagree with union leaders and others in the movement who have thrown people under the bus. And here I would say, you know, they've also thrown some of their own members under the bus, right? It's not only about union leaders having thrown people under the bus who are not, um, you know, part of the labor committees for, for whatever reasons, because, you know, people belong to, are coming to the struggle uh, for different reasons that are coming to the Morcha and the Sangharsh for different reasons, but they've also thrown under the bus some of their own, not leadership, but their own members. Um, and this is a tactic that unions all around the world, right, as they get bigger and as, you know, that's part of the push and pull of being in talks with the government. You think that you're approaching an agreement, so you're worried about it having been jeopardized. And that's what power does, right? Power makes us compromise in, uh, in unfortunate and unethical ways. But I think absolutely uh, what the whole leadership, what the whole Morcha, what the diaspora, what we all need to be doing is pulling in the same direction, which is offering our unconditional solidarity um, for people who acted on January 26th and not to let this be a moment. And we've seen this happening already and it's, it's really troubling, right? Which is, now the Indian state is using these fissures and this moment to criminalize and crack down even more. We opened up this webinar talking about the raids that are happening. You know, even tonight, I'm just before we started, just reading the news about all the raids that are happening in Punjab right now, as well as in Delhi. And so that is the very real violent consequence of this kind of divisive rhetoric. Um, and I think we absolutely have to reject it and we absolutely have to push back against it because it just means you know, there's there's ways to have internal debates, right? And that I leave to people in Delhi to have, I'm not there. They can have those kinds of internal debates about what exactly happened on the ground, whether it set the movement back or not, um, what people think about that, right? Be able to debrief it for lack of a better word. But uh, for those of us who are in, in diaspora, for those of us who are publicly on social media, this is absolutely, you know, not the time to be engaged in these public debates and to allow the state, state lackeys and liberals to weaponize that to, and to use that as a reason to crack down. I think um, that sort of leads to the next question that we wanted to ask. Um, it's related to a tweet that you put out um, when the events in the US unfolded 
and there was a mass call around the US and in Canada as well to label the right wing groups as a terrorist. And it's, on surface, it seemed like the right move to do, but you sort of came out opposing that whole framework of labeling organizations or individuals as terrorist organizations. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and in the context of like the, the things that we've seen that have happened again, six in Canada as well, and how that framework can be used by the state in general? Yeah, I think, um, and you know, I appreciate that talking to this crowd probably doesn't need a lot of convincing because we all know or have people um, who've been impacted by that, right? Of course, you know, so many struggles right now, including Free Juggie and others. Um, and the extraditions that have, you know, recently been uh, happening in the in the UK and Shamshir Baji, you probably know about that. I just I know about that on the surface, but um, you know, we know that the anti that the you know anti terror legislation, counter terror legislation, is you know completely designed to target communities that are seen as outside the state. So in the U.S. and Canada context. You know, whiteness is the state and anti-terror and counter-terror frameworks have always been used to target indigenous communities, Muslim communities, black communities, Sikh communities, left communities. Um, and so to suddenly think that, the, you know, that this entire state structure will pivot, <laughs> suddenly just change um, and just target white supremacists is just, it's naive. It won't work that way. Um, the entire infrastructure is not designed to take down white supremacists. Um, and, you know, I'll just point to two things. One is that, you know, while people are talking about adding Proud Boys in Canada, the white supremacist organization Proud Boys and the House of Commons just unanimously passed a motion, which is not binding, it's just a motion, um, to put Proud Boys on that list, there's no talk about removing everybody else from that list, right? What about the other 55 organizations that are still on that list, which are mostly Muslim organizations, Includes, a, you know, includes Sikh organizations, includes Palestinian organizations, Kurdish organizations. Are they still going to stay on the list, right? So while you may, you know, in the ideal sense, and you know, wave the magic wand, think the state does work the way it's that we think it will, though it won't. But let's say for a moment it will. What happens to all of those other organizations? They're still on the terrorist list, right? So the one thing that stood out for me is there's no. First of all, there's no parallel call to get rid of that list for everybody else. And there's nothing saying like only put white supremacists on this list, right? So that list will keep growing with its, you know, two token white people or white supremacist organizations and everybody else still on that list. Um, and the other thing that stands out to me is that, you know, one of the key features of anti-terror legislation in Canada, which I'm most familiar with, I don't know about other states, but in Canada, one of the pillars of anti-terror legislation is deportation. So what it does is it expedites the ability to deport people, right? So if there are permanent residents, if there are refugees who the Canadian state deems to be a security risk, the Canadian state can deport those people faster. And that is one of the consequences of anti-terrorism is to continue, is, you know, cast people as threats and outsiders, which is a racialized idea, and then to get rid of them through expulsion and deportation. So what are you going to do with white supremacists? Where are we deporting them to, right? Um, to nowhere. So it's like a smoke and mirrors. Because again, this entire system is designed to target racialized communities and then where possible, deport them. Um, so, you know, using anti-terror legislation to maintain whiteness um, doesn't really actually do anything. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's my main concern. And that, you know, in the long run, if the state continues to get more powers, our communities are gonna be the ones who are marginalized, right? Our communities are gonna be the ones who are targeted. When this moment passes, when suddenly everybody forgets about the Proud Boys, everybody you know, stops clutching their pearls, that's what's gonna happen. We will continue to face the national security state, but there will no longer be opposition to it because now suddenly it will be normalized, right? People will be like, oh, but it's not so bad. There's some white supremacists on it. I'm sure the other people are bad. Um, and so I think it needs to be dismantled. I don't think it's, a, it's a, an apparatus that can be reformed. Uh, and by that, I, of course, am in no way saying that we don't need to tackle white supremacy, of course, right? I just think using the national security state will in, A, be ineffective, um, and B, end up having the long-term effect of criminalizing um, and stigmatizing and causing more violence uh, on racialized communities. So we, we've seen um, how, uh, actually, before I ask this question, I, I know I know um, a bunch of people are asking questions in the Q&A function. Please uh, do use that function and we'll yeah. come to uh, questions 
uh, shortly. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see those. Will you ask those or should I be answering them? Yeah, we'll, we'll ask those to you. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so um, so essentially, yeah, this is the last question from us. Um, so we've seen how fascist mobs have, uh, mobs have been gathering at the protest sites um, and how they've threatened violence and are trying to provoke riots while the police uh, look on. Um, any thoughts on how to fight um, a literal fascist regime? Man. <laughs> <laughs> um. And this is like for a lot of six, right? This is evoking a lot of trauma because of yeah. what happened in Delhi, like yeah. to our parents' generation, which has completely been unresolved despite so much engagement with the state. So seeing people's reaction to the Nishan Saib on uh, the 26th, like a lot of six, I feel, felt that we've kind of gone too far. We've provoked India and we know what happens when we provoke yeah. India, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a real question, right? And that's why... Um, in my view, a lot of this is sorted out in Punjab on the ground and in Delhi on the ground because we just we don't know there, you know, the ins and outs of how those decisions are made. Sometimes those decisions are made on the spot. Um, and I'd say I want to acknowledge that that's a constant question. That's a constant question in all organizing, which is, you know, that balance and that back and forth between um wanting to push back against the state, but also again, knowing that the state will criminalize you. And then that circle of, well, they're gonna get us anyway, we may as well fight back, right? Like how to be fearless. Um, and I don't think it's an easy answer, but I do think what it does require is collective struggle. Um, we cannot alone face down the fascist state. We also alone cannot protect each other. Um, but I, I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, and that's exactly what state violence is meant to do. And I think that's also important to remember is that fascism and fascist state violence is meant to cause, um, and you know, so many have written, you know, Fanon has written about this. So many have written about the colonial condition, right? Like even in the formal colonial period, uh, that is the reason why so many people were unable to resist you know, resist colonialism in, in the 1800s and 1900s is not because, you know, now there's this myth that people liked colonialism because it brought roads and irrigation. Like, no, that's a colonial whitewashing, right? But it was this real struggle and, you know, dating back to Jalian Malabag, right? Like when you fight, even if you're peaceful, you will be targeted. But then if you fight back, you will be targeted even more. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't think it's an easy answer, but I, I do, as a general principle, um, do think that we have to fight back because the reality is that fascism is gonna squash us regardless, right? Like it is going to kill us regardless. Um, but I'm not saying that as, you know, in a way that is not attentive um, to those traumas or those triggers. I think we have to find a way uh, to deal with them, to talk about them and to find a way uh, to fight back in a way that feels powerful, that doesn't make us uh, targets of harm. Um, and, and also being prepared for that, right? Um, these are also, you know, debates that were happening in the civil rights movements in the US. Like, I'm just naming these to say that this is a very real, what we're feeling now, um, maybe we can draw some inspiration and some hope from our own history and also from other communities' histories to know that that is the dilemma that everybody faces every time during struggle, how to fight back without facing state repression and also knowing that state violence is omnipresent no matter what. Um, and that that is a, that's always going to be there. So I don't have um, a clear cut solution other than to say that, that we are thinking about this and that we are facing this is intentional. Mm -hmm. And any, um, any thoughts on how all the energy that the Nojuans have in the West and the diaspora to channel that energy to maybe dismantle the structures that we have here that are also proposing or putting forward some of the same injustices and some of the same um, in the same state violence against the communities here. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is, um, I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of this uh, for me comes from, um, uh, Having you know, having organized as a sick woman in a in a lot of in a lot of struggles, um, and I will say, you know, one of the the challenges that I've faced for a long time. There's many, 
Uh, but one is that, you know, a lot of times uh, when Sikh Nanjavan are involved in struggles that are outside the Sikh community, those are not seen as somehow involving the Sangat. And I think that's not true. I think that we have to think about the, you know, how do we do seva? And, you know, again, um, here I think about uh, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, how do we do seva for all? Um, and so when I think about, you know, what it means to be in solidarity with the Morchas, in Punjab and in Delhi, and how do, what do we do here in the West? I think about, for example, okay, what are farmer struggles here? What are farm worker struggles here? Um, and what do we do with the very real and thorny issue uh, that in the Sikh community and in the Punjabi community, there are a lot of people who went from being farm workers to being farm owners and who now own farms and also treat their farm workers poorly, right? Who, who employ migrant workers. Um, and I think those are questions that we don't see as part of Sikh community struggle. Um, and we don't see them as ways in which, in ways in which Nick, you know, Sikh Nojawan can be involved. But I see, for me, I very much see a connection because that is our obligation um, to Sangharsh for all people. Um, I also think about, you know, what are ways in which if we are thinking about, uh, if we're thinking about Punjab, if we're thinking about land, Right, a big part of, of struggle uh, for farmers and, and in Punjab is, of course, about land. Right, it's about um, it's about our rivers. It's about the land. What does that mean for the lands that we're on now? Right, what does it mean for those of us who are in the U.S. or Canada? How do we show up for Indigenous peoples and other people who are fighting for the land, um, who are trying to maintain uh, our, our you know our, our food sovereignty, who are trying to maintain the waters as clean. Um, and, you know, I, of course, and I've said this before and earlier is, you know, what are the ways in which we here are not reproducing uh, and are fighting against caste hierarchies, right? Um, how are we ensuring that, uh, you know, caste oppressed voices are in fact part of, of, um, of our conversations? And so uh, I think part of this, the struggle in the diaspora is also expanding what we think as the sick responsibility and the sick role in the communities where we live. Um, I think it means taking up and acting on police violence, right? Our communities, like it's impossible that we are, you know, sitting here condemning the violence in Delhi and here think about becoming cops. <laughs> like, what do we think we're going to be doing, right? What do we think we're going to be doing as police officers here in the diaspora? So I think it's there's sometimes a strange kind of way in which we talk about uh, what's happening in Punjab or Delhi or India as just over there, but not also those same kinds of violences here. Um, and so, you know, those are just some ways in which I think we can be involved and, you know, absolutely to fight back against the criminalization of Sikh resistance. I think a key issue in the diaspora is, um, is the ways in which uh, and especially in Canada, the ways in which Sikh organizations have been targeted, um, have been placed on terrorist lists, are you know facing extradition, are facing deportation. These are just you know some of the many ways I think in which um, being in solidarity means also acting locally. Mm -hmm. And I think you made a very strong point about the distinction between how we separate what's happening over there versus how we live in the West. Because if you look at it from a Sikh or a Pontic standpoint, there is no difference. If you're a Sikh, the human body is a Sikh and being part of that Pont is the same, doesn't matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Just because we've moved to the borders of Punjab, right? It's a, so that's a, that was a, that's a really good point. I think the, a lot of individuals need to think about it. But now we'll be moving to the questions from the Sangat. And one of the questions we have is, um, uh, thank you for acknowledging some of the divisions and tensions between the left and the Sikh movements. A lot of misunderstandings are worse in that, that many of us are relying on a 24 seven news cycles, media speculations and social media, also uh, social media echo chambers for our information. Can you talk about how to reconcile some of those tensions today? And how do, you, uh, how do you think we could cut through the noise and become better informed about the realities of the last one to 30 years, exam, uh, example being the agrarian crisis that has led to the current, uh, current uh, moment? Yeah, thank you for that, for that um, comment and that question. And I, yeah, I do think a lot of it 
is is precisely that. I think you're you're right on when you say this seems to be coloring the diaspora's the diaspora's reactions and interpretations on the ground, because I think the thing that we miss um, in news cycles, and this may sound cheesy and corny, but I'm a strong believer in this, um, is we miss those like those kinship networks, right? Like the ways that on the ground in Delhi, people are not, you know, we might see that one argument, but we don't also then see people sitting together and having longer together or sleeping, you know, as neighbors in tents next to each other. Um, and, you know, that one moment of fissure um, doesn't necessarily represent all the other ways in which um, conversation and dialogue are happening. And this is true for anything, right? Like we, we don't, we never have the full story um, and we never, you know, we never understand the complexity uh, of struggle. And that's the thing that is the most important thing for people who are new to, to, to kind of movement work is like, there's always complexity. There's no like one person's right, one person's wrong. I mean, sometimes obviously the state is wrong, but um, you know, that there's, there's just more happening. There's more complexity. Um, and that can be lost in diaspora because we just see these quick clips and are like, I can't believe so-and-so said that. Okay, yes. I can't believe so-and-so said that too, but what are people there saying? How are they responding to this? How are they holding you know, this person accountable? Um, and so I think that is a big part of this is, uh, you know, we're just, we don't, we, we have to acknowledge that we don't know. And I know that can be a really frustrating um, reality because we want to be so involved, right? Like, uh, but we, we just don't know. Um, and in terms of um, the question around, sorry, there was a piece about the um, the agrarian crisis. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. So they had asked that, uh, how do we cut through the noise and become better informed about the realities of the last 20 to 30 years? Example being the agrarian crisis that has led to the current moment. Yeah, and here, you know, maybe this is the, the writer in me coming out, but I think uh, I, I appreciate that question because I think there's no way, we just, we can't avoid learning unless we learn. Mm -hmm. um, and that means taking the time to, whatever form that takes, right? Whether you like books, whether you like movies, whatever, whatever documentaries, whatever form that takes. But I think we have to study and struggle. Um, and that's, that is just something we're not going to get on social media. It means taking the time to sit with, you know, for example, learning about the Green Revolution, you know, learning about the agrarian crisis, reading, you know, the works of Sinath and others who, you know, focus on, on, on the agrarian crisis, um, looking at what's happening around the world uh, with privatization of farmland. Um, and I, I really appreciate that question because I think a lot about how, you know, in a social media world, we're so connected to the entire world, but in some ways we actually just know less about the world um, because we, we have such quick access that we don't think we need to take that, you know, that curiosity that we have um, gets satiated by these temporary uh, doom scrolling. Um, and so I appreciate that, you know, the way that that question and the way that we cut through the noise, I, I think is to slow down, to slow down and take the time. I see Shamshir Baji's bookshelf, <laughs> you know, whether it's books or again, whatever form it takes, uh, we, we, we have to do that. We have to have the, the discipline to do that work. Thank you for that. And, and we've been finding that ourselves as well in, in the small group conversations that we've been having. One of the the biggest kind of um, shortcomings, especially in the diaspora, seems to be a lack of political education. And, and we jump that for media representation because we want to be seen, we want to be heard by whiteness, and we look towards the state to kind of resolve all of our issues. And I think that goes deep into conversations of sovereignty and colonization. Um, I've checked a couple of resources in the chat if anybody wants to look into um, the sick dynamics and the background and the context of this. And, and those are important conversations that are continually kind of demonized and, and, and erased. Um, and that takes us to our next question from, from the Sangat. Um, what parallels do you see in Nagaland, Kashmir, Punjab? And what does this tell us about the Indian state itself? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, you know, there's differences in their parallels. I think, um, you know, and without going to another hour, um, I'd say the parallels really are the ways in which since its very inception, the Indian state has controlled territory and has extracted from territory um, and has attempted to rule. And again, with the undergirding of Hindu fascism, um, but, you know, framed as secularism, but it isn't. Uh, attempted to annex and control territory. Um, and that central piece around territory, I think, is one um, that is unavoidable. Um, 
And, you know, of course, there are many differences, but I think here it is important to um, highlight that the struggle for self-determination in Kashmir, for Azadi in Kashmir, really is bearing the brunt of Indian occupation. Um, just in, you know, in, in Kashmir is the most militarized region in the entire world. And so even as we draw parallels, it is important to express and show our solidarity and to act in solidarity with Kashmir, with Kashmiri Sikhs and others, um, you know, to really understand the ways in which the Indian state enacts its annexations in, in different ways. Um, but absolutely, I mean, the annexation of territory, the waging of war, you know, India is in a constant state of warfare. It's in a constant state of warfare, one of the largest militaries in the world. Um, and again, you know, that's just the overt use of military force. And then we also have the coupling of that with economic power, right? The ways in which the center has controlled Punjab, the ways in which the center is pushing through special economic agreements in Adivasi lands and tribal lands. Uh, throughout the Indian state, like there's just there's a there's constant um, annexation and land grabbing and controlling um, by the center, and uh, you know that is that is just the reality. That is like a, that is not an ideological statement. That is a factual reality of the Indian state. Not a single year has gone by since 1947 where India has not waged some kind of quote unquote foreign or quote unquote domestic war. The next question from the Sangat that we have is, what are some useful ways for us in the diaspora to respond to people in our own community that block and shun people from taking direct action against India and the things that they might be saying, it'll, it'll make it worse, or they will say that we are X, Y, Z, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is good advice or not, um, but I'd have to say, you know, now I'm, I'm older and I'm in a, you know, quote unquote, more respectable kind of paid job. But for 20 years of my life, um, I was shunned by a lot of gatekeepers in the Sikh and Punjabi community for being someone who advocated direct action, who engaged in direct action, um, who, and who also expressed solidarity um, in the Pantic spirit with people who are seen as, you know, undesirable, including, you know, women in the downtown east side, indigenous women, people who use drugs, sex workers, etc. Um, and, you know, I've had, you know, Punjabi and Sikh radio broadcasters um, go on their talk shows uh, and call me, you know, Bachala and call me a terrorist. And so um, the reason I'm talking about myself here is to say there is no avoiding the fact that that will happen. Uh, the decisions that we have to make individually and as a punt is whether that is something we're willing to take on. Um, because the reality is, is there are going to be gatekeepers. Um, you know, some people like our parents <laughs> may be saying it for different reasons, right? That comes from a place of love and concern. So I'm not intending to lump everyone together, but we can't pretend that there aren't larger state interests, right? Like, especially in the diaspora where there are either political leaders who are aligned with their political party interests, which are then naturally embedded in state interests, or there are the kind of like multicultural gatekeepers who get funding from the state um, and who have, you know, provide really important kind of services to the community, but who really, um, their role is to maintain uh, our community in a particular state, right? They may not intend to, but that's what those kind of funding agreements end up doing and creating. And so, you know, in some ways, you know, to our parents, <laughs> the response will look different. Um, but there are going to be people that we cannot convince and we can't we can't pretend we can convince them because that is their social location. It's not about you know, individually convincing them because someone else might replace them and that person will be in the same role. Um, so what do we say to those people? I mean, maybe you know, start with a conversation, of course, you know, try to figure out what their, what their disagreements are. You know, oftentimes there are you know, very legitimate reasons uh, but if it's coming from a place of gatekeeping, then we have to make that decision about our own uh, our own motivations, our own sense of seva, our own sense of justice, right? And, and what we and others we're alongside are willing to do. Um, so 
just moving on, do you have any thoughts or suggestions on other activists um, or organizations um, working on intersecting areas like, for example, um, Philippine farm workers resisting, um, you know, for food justice um, that would pressure the Indian state um, as a means of perhaps hunger prevention or present rights under, I don't know, some uh, declaration of the UN uh, on present rights and rural workers that they made in, in 2018. Um, I guess the question is, who should we be, uh, be building solidarity with specifically right now? That's a, that's a beautiful question um, and really kind of, you know, speaks to that internationalist spirit um, that this is not only happening in Punjab um, and not only happening to farmers across India. Uh, Via Campesina, for example, is one of the largest global coalitions uh, and some of the uh, farm worker organi farming organizations and farm worker organizations in Punjab and in India are part of La Via Campesina. And La Via Campesina is this global coalition that includes peasant movements from around the world, um, including, of course, you know, one of the most formidable um, movements of peasants, which is the Landless Workers Association, the Landless Workers uh, in Brazil, MST. Um, and so, you know, that's one place that I have been thinking a lot about um, and have been connecting um, with people in the Punjab who are part of La Via Campesina about, you know, what can we, and I, I failed to mention this in the diaspora context, but mentioned it briefly, you know, part of what we can, how can we in the diaspora lift up um, and connect farming and farm worker struggles where we're located with what's happening in Punjab, right? And uh, one of the traditions that we've generally lost um, is, is what used to be international solidarity delegations, right? Which is because now we have access to social media and we very quickly read about what's happening in the world, uh, we never have the opportunity. And of course, right in this immediate moment, COVID, um, we don't have the ability to travel and learn from different movements, but in the eighties and nineties and you know, even predating that 60s, 70s, um, so you know, kind of international solidarity delegations were a huge part of how movements built, built up each other's strengths and you know, people visiting different um, different places to, to learn. And so uh, Via Campesina also does a lot of that. They kind of facilitate um, uh, conversation and learning and solidarity between different um, food sovereignty, food justice, uh, and farm worker organizations. And so um, that that is one place that we can start. And I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, you for taking time out to be part of our discussion and all the attendees that have also taken the time out on this Saturday to join us today. And please do follow all our social medias. We're still on Facebook and Instagram, but also do know our website, panthpunjab.org. Our Twitter has been suspended. Um, we have a shareable that's going around that we'd like to request Sangha to share to put more pressure on Twitter to see if we can get that back. But in case anything else goes down, our website will always be up. Hopefully, fingers crossed. But uh, do keep following our website for more content. We'll be having another discussion tomorrow with a, a youth activist from Punjab, Kanu Priya. So please uh, look out on our social media pages for information about that. I'd like to again thank Harsha Wali for taking time out and joining us today. And uh, thank you, everyone. Wahiguru Ji Ka Khalsa. Wahiguru Ji Ka Khalsa.